podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people? That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. Welcome to Smart People Podcast. I'm Chris Stem. And I'm John Rojas. Hope everybody's having a great morning, afternoon, or night whenever you choose to listen to it because that's the beauty of podcasts. That's the greatest thing ever, isn't it? I know. You can, you can uh, absorb our content. We're really excited today. I'm going to tell you guys, I'm looking over the bio of the guy we interviewed today. I really don't know how we got him on the show, actually. No, it makes me feel so inferior. Yeah, but how did this happen? I don't know. Uh, one thing I will say is quick shout out to everyone who's ever been on the show. People are willing to pass along their information. They're not really hawking any wares. I mean, they have a book. They mention it for 10 seconds, but they spend 30 minutes just giving away information for free. Wait, that's kind of what we do, too. That's an interesting lead. I was trying to figure out where you're going with I, this. That just came to me. Just came? Why don't you tell them how they can help us out? Well, they could head over to our site, smartpeoplepodcast.com. Click the glorious Amazon banner at the top of the page, do their Amazon shopping, and we get a nice little kickback from Amazon for doing some marketing for them. It really supports the show. You guys have been awesome since the beginning of January. We're getting a nice little uh, nice little stream of some income coming in there. And like we mentioned before, we're using this money to do some really cool projects and hopefully make the show grow. That's true. That's true. So I'm not going to bore you with anything else you can do other than... Email us, Facebook us, Twitter us, go to iTunes, rate us, go to our website, sign up for the newsletter, anything like that. So uh, this is such a pertinent topic. The guy we talked to today is a, he's an expert on executives, CEOs, C-level execs at large companies and why they screw up. Yeah, I like that. I like the fact that all his research, well, not all his research, but the majority of his research focuses around CEO failures, why they fail and what can be done to prevent it. And I like how we we come off as a little crass here, but he does say these are good people. A lot of them do great work. They change corporations that shape our businesses and our, our lives. But a lot of them, eh, not so much. I, you know, he, he puts out a list. We don't really go into it because you can find it with a Google search, but the worst CEOs of each year. And that's an interesting one. But he does talk about how he found in his research, most of them want to do well. They want to do good by their company. So that's just a little pick me up. Let's get into this week's guest. It is Dr. Sidney Finkelstein. He is the Stephen Roth Professor of Management at the Tuck School at Dartmouth College. He teaches courses on leadership and strategy. He has published 15 books, over 70 articles, several bestsellers. His number one bestseller is called Why Smart Executives Fail. And it's an awesome book. One of the things he talks about is the neuroscience behind it. Because decision making is something that's deeply ingrained from the time we were cavemen. And it's very hard to get out of your system. And we all do it. And, and these, these rich, top of the world people, they are subject to the same screw ups as we are. They're just in the limelight. Yep, absolutely. So uh, Sydney, he's got his PhD from Columbia, a couple other degrees. He's listed in the world's top 25 leadership gurus, CEO forums. He's had three books nominated for the Academy of Management's Terry Book Award, which is the most prestigious honor in that field. The point is, this guy knows what he's... I mean, he's on Smart People Podcast for a reason, let's be honest. So we're glad we could bring him to you, really kind of tune in, Learn a little bit about what to look for. Oh, and before I go, if you're thinking about another job or where you should start looking and you start interviewing, we do talk about what you should look for, what these managers mean to you, how they're going to help you through your career. So uh, this is advice you'd normally pay for. Yeah, and if anybody's actually doing cool work and looking for somebody to work for them, somebody might be available soon. And that rhymes me. with Ron. I don't even know where to go with that. <coughs> Why don't you guys just listen to somebody who actually has something worthwhile to say? Sidney Finkelstein. <laughs> so 
thank you again for being on the show. The first thing I just wanted to dive into is you are, when I was doing my research and, you know, reading through your books, you are what could be considered an expert on executives and not just executives, but high level, high profile executives. And, you know, we don't get to talk to people that kind of rub shoulders with these guys who are leading the top companies in the world. So the first thing I want to ask you was, did you see a, a typical profile of, you know, the high powered, important executive when doing all your research? Well, of course, a lot of my research was on um, senior executives that have stumbled and, and failed. And um, and they certainly had a certain a certain profile. But I would say more more generally, um, there's lots and lots of people that could make it to the top. What they have in common is they are incredibly uh, hard workers. They're willing to sacrifice almost uh, everything uh, to get to the uh, to get to the top. And I'd also say that, and uh, in almost uh, without exception, they're, uh, they're 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 good people. Contrary to maybe some of the public opinion of these things, um, they're uh, they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to do good things. It's not to say they don't like to get rich along the way. Uh, but um, they uh, they're, they're trying to accomplish important goals, and they're uh, and they're generally speaking very capable. Just in that statement, I'm like, oh, I have so many questions. One of them being, and you said, you know, they want to get rich along the way, but they're good people and they want to do good things. Did you see often that people tend to get more concerned with money and compensation? The you know, the more money they make, is there a direct correlation between the higher up you get, you now tend to pay less attention to what you're there for and more just to kind of cash out? No, I, I don't think that's the case. Certainly, um, everyone knows what their compensation is and everybody would like to know what all their coworkers are getting paid, uh, <laughs> no matter what type of job that you have. And, you know, sometimes you can actually find that out when you work for a, uh, for uh, for a state government type of organization, for example, but as you go very uh, very high up in an organization, they certainly care a lot about compensation, but it doesn't crowd out anything else. The thing that happens at uh, at the higher levels of organizations, we're talking about the top top five, for example, is that their compensation becomes publicly available, and that means all of their peers in other companies in the same industry or any industry for that matter, their compensation becomes uh, it has to be disclosed. Uh, in uh, in proxy statements uh, and 10K statements. And that means that you can compare your compensation to others. And that's a very powerful thing, just as it is for, for, for almost anyone. We want to know how we're doing. And, and, and the net effect of that is that compensation becomes almost a scorecard for your, uh, your quality as an executive, as a, as a CEO, uh, rightly or, or wrongly. And so you pay a lot of attention to it for that reason. I don't think that's that crowds out your attention to doing a good job or trying to accomplish whatever your goals are, but you do pay a lot of attention to it. I was going to say that one of the negative effects of that with the public knowledge of compensation packages being out there is when we see a company fail and a CEO still gets paid a very high compensation or, or severance package, many people start to wonder, they're like, okay, why is this guy getting $20 million going out the door where he has turned a company into a, a not profitable company or the market cap has you know been cut in half or whatever you have do you think that we are paying the CEOs the right way or is there another way that we can kind of pay these guys not really more on like a performance base but something where it would alleviate that general perception of oh these people are getting golden parachutes on the way out uh, you know, I think you're putting your finger on the one thing that drives people absolutely uh, bananas. People that have failed, CEOs that have failed or, or uh, have not done a great job, they get fired and they walk away with, it, with these incredible packages. Uh, the reason that happens is, that to, is, is to hire them in the first place. They all have their own compensation consultants and lawyers and advisors. And at that level, they come to the table knowing uh, pretty much uh, the general range that they want and they want some protection in case things don't work out. So it's almost like, you know, before before you uh, even get someone into the CEO seat, uh, they have got that uh, that going away package set up. And yet you can't, uh, it's very difficult to hire them uh, otherwise. And sure. uh, so that's where it comes from. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, that's what the market is demanding um, is the first, first answer to that. And then the second answer is there really is a belief once that board of directors uh, settles on a potential uh, CEO candidate that uh, this is the person you want and at that point uh, 
Um, you're not going to let a few million dollars get in the way. Hmm. And so, and of course, you're not thinking that, that he or she's going to fail. And, uh, and so, you know, if it's a successful CEO that generates potentially billions of dollars in shareholder value, there is nothing wrong with paying that person um, what most of us would consider a very, very high uh, compensation. So I think those are the reasons uh, that all this happens, and that's really what's in play. It happens before you get before somebody gets hired. Right. And I mean, do you think that there will be a shift in the way that we do these compensation packages where I believe you've mentioned in the past where the board of directors could decide on restricted stocks versus stock options for the CEOs? Do you think we'll ever get to that point? Will that be more commonplace? The the issue around restricted ver, restricted stock versus stock options is a is a tough one. Stock options became extremely powerful uh, with the rise of uh, of the internet and internet 1.0 companies from around uh, late 1990s. And uh, some of these um, some of these CEOs from those companies, um, many of them were in their 20s or 30s, were making incredible payday when the market was skyrocketing. And that's all that uh, CEOs of Fortune 1000 companies wanted to see. Uh, once that happened, well, they wanted, to, they wanted a piece of that action. In theory, stock options play a very important role because they increase the odds that a CEO or a top management team will engage in appropriate risk-taking and, and, and the strategies that they follow. And the reason why that's a good thing is because they cannot diversify, if you will, their own risk. If you're the CEO, all of your, your entire job, 100% of that job is in working for company X. And, uh, and if, it, if it doesn't work out, you're going to lose that job. And so uh, that creates a natural tendency for, for people not to take very many risks So because uh, you don't want to lose your job if it goes wrong. That's where stock options came from. So like a lot of things, it, makes sense, it made sense at a certain point in time. The difficulty is that stock options are a one-way street. So if things go well, uh, you make money. If things don't go well, you don't actually get your pay docked. Restricted stock means you're actually getting stock. Uh, and if, if things go well, the stock goes up. If things go don't go so well, the value of that stock goes down, and so you actually get punished. And so it's a much more balanced uh, uh, approach. Uh, I, I think it's probably some combination of restricted and stock options that's going to be the right uh, formula. But again, this, like everything else we're talking about, is completely negotiable between CEO and board of directors in the process of, uh, of getting the job and then year after year in determining the compensation contract. And I mean, we didn't even want to hone in on pay. It's just one of those things that it's it's in the news and you you know about it so much in terms of executive pay seems absorbent, especially in comparison to other countries. But and, and you've talked to so many that I just figured we'd throw it out there. Sure. I do want to kind of get into now more about what you've written about in your two books, the one that was wildly successful, Why Smart Executives Fail and What You Can Learn from Their Mistakes. And then the newer one, Think Again, Why Good Leaders Make Bad Decisions and How to Keep It from Happening to You. Both of these books are fantastic. I think a lot for the reason you go into how the brain works, how we make decisions, and then how these decisions get people into trouble, especially people in the, these large organizations. If you could talk a little bit about how the brain makes these decisions. I think, um, and it's not just I think, there's a lot of research to support this from all sorts of different people in cognitive psychology, neuroscience, and people like me that study leaders in real organizations, um, that we're, we're wired to make quick decisions. And, and, who, and who doesn't? We rely on things like intuition, quick decision making. You remember Jack Welch's book, Straight from the Gut and all that. It's a natural tendency to do that. The reason why we do it is very simple. If you think about our, um, our ancestors a millennia ago sitting around the campfire and, uh, and, and they see this, this striped animal running faster and faster towards them, those ancestors of ours that decided to form a committee to talk about it didn't survive that saber-toothed tiger attack. They, uh, uh, they didn't do so well. And so you needed to decide, you need to make very, very quick decisions. And you know what our, our, our brains and how, it's, and how our brains have processed information over time? It's really in part due to this, this type of evolution. The difficulty is in modern society and in modern business, it's so complex that uh, relying on these quick, intuitive decisions all the time can get you in trouble because all of us have a set of biases that influence how we think. We, we all have that because um, these biases are nothing more than, than shortcuts. We tend to rely on our experience maybe more than we should. We tend to overestimate the quality of that experience. Uh, we all make prejudgments. Um, we have attachments to uh, all sorts of things. And, and these things all uh, play a role in how we make decisions. 
I'm so glad you say that because I am not a big fan of just sitting around and mulling things over. And it bothers me to, you know, when I know what decision I want to make, yet I have to run it by six layers of management and, and all of those things. So just to know that that's kind of how we're hardwired is a good thing. However, like you mentioned now, that becomes an issue. So I guess I wanted to say next is what's the proper way to go about hashing out decisions and making sure we think through them in a fashion that works for today's, you know, modern arena? Sure. Well, you know, in my uh, uh, work, my consulting uh, work and, and, and speaking and teaching with uh, senior executives and, and MBA students, for that matter, I've developed a set of questions that you could ask yourself and ideally ask yourself in a team environment uh, that can help give some insight into whether you're more likely to fall into this trap of these types of, these types of biases. Uh, for example, I mentioned uh, briefly prejudgment. Uh, is it possible that there's a prejudgment at work? What's a prejudgment? It's when we decide something is the way it is and we don't really want to uh, collect very much other data uh, about that. We've just made this kind of flash judgment and uh, we, we barely know we've done it. And, uh, uh, and then we stick to it regardless of what the, what the data uh, indicate. And, and there's lots of uh, examples from, you know, even terrible events like Hurricane Katrina and how the U.S. government, uh, the, the, the leadership of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, made a uh, prejudgment that a hurricane in, uh, in New Orleans um, would not be much different than a hurricane in South Florida, even though factually that's an extremely dangerous uh, and inaccurate prejudgment. But once you make that prejudgment, you tend to underestimate just how significant the damage could be uh, and you stick with it, uh, even in the face of all sorts of other data. And by the way, that's how uh, people can tell uh, very often whether somebody has uh, a prejudgment, whether a prejudgment is at work. It's when somebody relies on certain type of data or certain data that is consistent with their point of view and disregards or ignores all kinds of other data. Um, and you can see that. So, you know, you're making an important decision. You could ask that question. Well, what's the data we're looking at? Why are we looking at that data? Why are we not looking at some counterfactuals? And, uh, and how do you know you haven't really kind of pre-decided the whole, the whole thing? It's not that a prejudgment is always bad, by the way. Not, not at all. Uh, it might be, it might not be. But if you're going to make an important decision and you're going to rely kind of on your gut instinct without even thinking about it, at least be aware that that's what you're doing and don't fool yourself into thinking that you've been very thoughtful and, and analytical and, and, and the like. Um, another question, another example is around, uh, is around experience. Uh, all of us tend to overestimate the quality and importance and relevance of our experience. And it's really remarkable uh, because uh, the natural tendency is, is for people to go and look for um, and, and, and actually do it almost automatically, go back to what you've done before that's worked. If, if you've done something that's worked before, let's do it again. If you haven't done it before, if, you, if, if, you, uh, if it hasn't worked that well in the past, then let's make sure we don't uh, make that same mistake again. Completely common sense, except that logic only works under one condition, which is if the situation we're facing today is exactly the same as the situation we faced yesterday. And how often is that the case? We tend to uh, overgeneralize uh, around experience. This is one of the reasons why I think a lot of mergers and acquisitions fail, uh, because um, companies and leaders of organizations uh, figure, well, we've already done an acquisition or two or three. Uh, we know it works. We know it doesn't work. Let's just apply what works and, and make sure we don't make the same mistakes. But in fact, every acquisition is different. Every situation is different. And the things that worked before do not necessarily, um, are not necessarily going to work um, the next time. It's kind of like what, what you see in, in, in and investment advisors or mutual funds, you know, past performance it does not predict future performance. Uh, and until we, uh, we have a little bit uh, uh, more nuanced uh, and variable or different types of experiences uh, around a particular problem, uh, we tend to overgeneralize and uh, as a result, simplify the types of decisions that we make. Those are two fantastic points. I mean, they really are. Just the one about not using your, your past experiences to determine future outcomes is just so great because it, it gives you more hope for, you know, just be kind of nimble and dynamic and try to take on as much information as you can and make a decision going forward based on that research. And I love that rather than just, ah, I did this in the past. The other thing, and it goes along with your first thought about kind of having preconceptions and everything. I read in your book, you said, that's why executives hire consultants, because 
they just want you to come on board to confirm the decision they've already made. And, and so they're just paying a bunch of money to kind of say, hey, look, these guys said it was all right. And I just thought that was fantastic for so many reasons. But I wanted you to, you know, say that people oftentimes don't go through a decision process. They just they know it and they and they run with it. And again, sometimes you do know it uh, and sometimes you should run with it. Uh, but the question you have to ask is, you know, do you have the right experience? Are the right people uh, sitting there around the room? Are you, are you deluding yourself in, in believing that you know more than, than, uh, than you do? Have you relied on this, uh, on this prejudgment? And, you know, one of the, one of the reasons why, uh, or rather, one of the groups that hardly ever falls into this trap, at least uh, for a period of time, are entrepreneurs. Because the entrepreneurs, you know, when you're starting a business, you look at an established business, you say, okay, they're doing it this way, and they can't adapt nearly as fast as you can as an entrepreneur. And you're not going to do what they've always done in the past because you haven't done anything in the past. And it creates a whole new frame of reference for you. It's a very powerful uh, thing. And, and, and by the way, as good as that is for an entrepreneur, it's always a, there's always a, 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 um, a but to the, uh, to the question <laughs> because over time, if you've been successful as an entrepreneur, you begin to believe that you've got it all figured out also. Uh, and then you stop learning the new things. You stop questioning all the things you questioned before. It's really ironic. Some of those things that get you to the top, if left unchanged, will also lead to your eventual downfall. Kind of like a Greek tragedy. Two things on my paper here with questions that I want to ask both go into that. One is... It seems like a general theme throughout a lot of your research is stay humble, invite criticism, invite debate, and try to see all sides of the argument. Do you think that's a pretty good summation of a lot of your recommendations? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I think that's good, and it's exactly opposite to the types of CEOs we saw uh, <laughs> in the uh, uh, late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, I'll just tell you one quick thing about, about that. When, when Why Smart Executives Fail came out and I listed all these habits and characteristics of unsuccessful leaders and people, um, uh, I had uh, a senior uh, Wall Street uh, banker call me who knew me uh, through, through, through Tuck, the business school, and uh, said, you know, your profile of what you shouldn't do is exactly what uh, just about uh, everyone was looking for on Wall Street for years and years. <laughs> I, I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, do you do you see the tide changing? Are people realizing this and bringing in people to actually sit on the other side of the table and say, "Hey, you're wrong. Here's why." Well, you know, there, there's a little bit more of that. It's a tough thing because you're going against human nature. This is one of the the big uh, challenges, and this is why I think I'm always going to be in business as someone pointing out what's going wrong and trying to learn from it because we're going against human nature. It's human nature mm -hmm. to. Uh, once you've been successful, to believe that you know more than others. It's human nature to become complacent over time when you think you figured it out. Uh, so it's not an easy thing. But yes, I am seeing some uh, changes. Uh, I spent a lot of my own time in, uh, in my own uh, personal work uh, trying to help organizations and leaders see that side of the story. I think boards of directors uh, are slowly, uh, very slowly, but somewhat surely, uh, becoming more effective as that sounding board, uh, as, as a group that can raise their hand and say, you know, look, this is not going right. We need to do something about that. But the most effective leaders are the ones, uh, time and time again, that surround themselves with not just great talent, but talent that are unleashed, talent that, have an op that has an opportunity to have an impact and can push back and challenge. So uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that is the best path to the top. But because it goes against a lot of Human nature, uh, we still see a lot of a lot of folks that, that, that don't get that. I kind of want to add on to that question because I look at companies like Zynga, Facebook, and some of these fast-growing internet-based companies, and they kind of have that mentality where they, you know, they want the the smart guys there. But when we saw with Zynga, they let everybody walk out the door. All their talent went away. And then kind of with Facebook, too, you've got Zuckerberg, who really has his thumb on everything. And they have some talented guys, but are they able to really speak up and prove their talent? If this is happening you know, now with even these younger CEOs and coming up in this age, what's it really going to take to see, OK, what you've said could be the model of success? How do we get to that? You know, you, know, uh, you, can, you can do a little experiment. Imagine that you give someone a billion dollars uh, or more in the case of, uh, 
in, in the case of Zuckerberg. And, and, and you tell him the reason why you're getting this money is because you really did something very, very uh, powerful and important. And you were the one who did it. Um, we could look at a thousand people and very few of them will have their heads straight after that. And that's what <laughs> happens. To them. It, it's not a it's not an easy thing to do. Sure. But the history of business is littered with examples of rising um, uh, of shooting stars that come back to earth uh, very heavily and uh, uh, in a very embarrassing way. Uh, there are so many examples. So I, I really found when when I could share some of these stories, of failure and, and and illustrate what goes wrong and, and maybe maybe make some suggestions on what to do about that. Um, uh, there's a there, there's a fair hearing that goes on, but it's uh, it, it's it's not an easy thing to do. You know, you mentioned you mentioned uh, Zynga, uh, and they have had that revolving door at the top, and and that to me has always been one of the strongest early warning signs for eventual failure and even even bankruptcy. Right. So um, um, hedge fund listeners, uh, beware. I think that's uh, one of the most important things you can look at. Should there be some type of, we have term limits in politics, should boards of directors start looking at it that way where they recognize that their CEO is that bright burning star, got to a certain point, and keep him within the company? I mean, I know that that goes against everything because once you're at the top, there's no way that you're going to take a demotion. But cycling through new thought processes, new ideas, and that kind of stuff, have you seen any boards of directors that do that, where they kind of have a revolving CEO, but then I guess, you know, that's almost looked at as a negative thing from a shareholder perspective, too. Yeah, you know, you, you don't want a revolving CEO because, you know, that means you can't find the right, the right man or the right, right. The right woman. Uh, but there are boards of directors that are very aggressive in removing CEOs. They tend to be called venture capitalists. And the reason <laughs> why they have this um, um, vigilance, if you will, is because they have real skin in the game. They've got a lot of money that they personally and their firms have invested into these companies. And so they're not going to play around with someone who's not going to be who they think is not the one to turn the company around. Boards of directors tend to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more removed. Uh, they, they hardly ever. Uh, in, in say a Fortune 1000 type of company, hardly ever have the same amount of money as venture capitalists might have in, invested. So, so there are examples of this of this happening. I don't think you want to be this on a regular basis because it's it indicates you can't find the right person. But I'll say one other thing about this, which is um, we know we know that organizations, businesses of all types, uh, fail, uh, go out of business, things go wrong. And I think the single best thing you can possibly do is to regenerate uh, talent. It's almost like, you know, all of us, all, all, all people, uh, we, we all die. And why do we die? We're not reproducing enough new cells to take place, take the place of cells that are going, going by the wayside or they're starting to get damaged. I think organizations um, are, are an analogous type of situation. Uh, and I think the solution is to regenerate talent, not just at the CEO level, but up and down the organization. I think the best organizations are actually unafraid to see even some good people leave because that opens the door for new people to come in and have, a, have an impact. And uh, to me, uh, you know, there's no holy grail, um, uh, you know, or, or silver bullet in, in business. There's so many things that are needed to make a, a business or any organization be successful. But, but this one about regenerating talent is probably going to be near the very uh, top of that list. A lot of people that listen aren't in or ever going to be in a position where they're running a massive company, but most will at some point be working for that person or somebody similar. So I wanted to, to ask you, what can the normal person look for in a manager, in an executive team, in a company that might say, hey, this company is looking out for me. They're going to be here a while. This is a place I want to settle down. Yeah, it's uh, um, it's something that uh, our MBA students at Tuck are always asking about, and actually every MBA student wants to know who should you work for, right. uh, who should we look, uh, how, how should I evaluate my potential um, uh, boss, and uh, and we do know by the way from a lot of research that uh, your first uh, boss in a career and first boss at a new stage in career, such as graduating with a, with an MBA, uh, is uh, is one of the most single most important. Um, people uh, in in your career trajectory are they a supporter are they uh, are they uh, are they challenging you are they developing you do they really care or are they more claiming credit and, and 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 a taker and so if I was in an interview like that and I was thinking about that I'd like to know 
uh, about who's been, you know, who's been on your team. That's what I'd be asking. Who are some of the people who've been on your team in the last five years and where are they today? And uh, I'd like to know that they've moved up, even if it's in another company, that they moved up and have been, uh, have been successful, have, uh, have had greater, uh, greater opportunities. Uh, I think you could ask about decision-making style. You could ask about the role of the team. You could ask about delegation. Again, the best leaders at any level in an organization are uh, highly effective uh, uh, delegators. Uh, and, and so you can ask some very specific questions that start to get at uh, these themes of open-mindedness, adaptability, developing talent, uh, caring about other people, uh, which I think are, uh, are really critical. And by the way, you could also ask about compensation in a broad sense and not how much money you're going to get paid because, you know, that's not the first question you're going to start with. But how, do, how are people evaluated? What are the metrics that are, that are used to evaluate people? And in some of the best organizations I know, uh, there, there are kind of dual dual types of metrics. Number one, of course, is you know, did you produce? Did you get results? Whatever that, whatever that business does. And number two, did you develop talent? Did you bring other people along, or did you step on other people along the way? And you can point to that. And 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 some of the best organizations are tracking very closely your the ability, the extent to which an individual is able to develop talent. That's great advice. I think that's a great place to end and leave that with our listeners when they're, you know, looking for their next job or when they're evaluating opportunities. So I really want to say again, thank you so much for being on this show. Your books, again, Why Smart Executives Fail, that one was kind of your cornerstone of a lot of your research and then followed up with Think Again, Why Good Leaders Make Bad Decisions and How to Keep It From Happening to You. I wanted to see if you could direct our listeners to, I know you have a blog, anywhere else they can find you and more information about what you do. Well, there's lots of sources. Uh, you could look at the uh, Tuck Business School at Dartmouth uh, website where there's a lot of information about me. Of course, you can, you can Google me. You can follow me on Twitter at Sid Finkelstein, S-Y-D, at Sid Finkelstein. And I have a blog called The Sid Blog, and I blog for Forbes and U.S. News and World Report and various other places as well. So there's a lot of places to get there. But I think on a day-to-day -day basis, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, I've been tweeting more and more about different issues that are coming up in business and some interesting articles or things that, that I've come across that I want to share. So at Sid Finkelstein would be the best way to do that. That's great. And yeah, I definitely ask that people go check that out, especially your articles on the, the worst CEOs are fantastic. And everybody should look at those and kind of keep in mind uh, what's going on there. Really appreciate that as well. Thanks. Good, uh, good conversation. And I look forward to, to hearing it on the podcast. Great. All right. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Okay. Bye. All righty. Bye bye. Hey, everybody. I know that it's, you know, very likely you're listening to this on a mobile device. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop the podcast in exactly 20 seconds. Open up your email, your, your email, whatever it is, and send an email to smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. And the subject can literally be anything you want or nothing at all. The point is we are coming out with, you know, some really good content soon. We are aggregating all of our past, you know, 70 plus episodes. We're going to take best ofs. We're going to take advice. We're going to take quotes. And we're going to send them out just to our email base. All you got to do is be part of it. We'll opt you in if, as long as you hit us up. And um, I promise you, since we've been doing this, we've only sent out maybe five. So you're not going to get an onslaught. It's just going to be the best information we have. Yeah. And if you want to send emails and talk about anything else too, go for that. I love talking to people about what ideas they have, who they want to have on the show, that kind of stuff. If you want to see us do something and move in another direction or whatever it may be, we'll listen to you. I'm not going to say that we'll do it, but you know, we'll get some discussion going back and forth. I really want to see what you guys have in terms of ideas, ideas for the show, ideas in ways that we can help you out and give you more content. That's I, all we really want to do is give you more stuff. I actually think we've responded to every single email we've ever gotten. Yeah. So just which let, is a, a good amount. Yeah, absolutely. Let us know what it is you want and we'll see if we can do it. All right, guys, be sure to tune in next week. Thanks for listening.